Revelation chapter 2. The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter 2. And I want to begin reading with verse number 1. Those of you that are familiar with this portion of Scripture knows that this is a letter written to a church, the church at Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus right. Now Ephesus was a large city for that time. 225,000 people is what I've read lived in that city. So there's a group of believers that were there and the Lord is writing to that church that was in that city. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Then he begins in verse number two and the Lord says, I know thy works. So the Lord begins this letter to the church at Ephesus by saying, I know about you. I know what you are doing. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for not my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. This seems to be a very good church. They were working for the Lord. They had spiritual discernment. They were doctrinally correct. They weren't letting false teachings and false doctrines come in the church. But now after saying some good things about the church, notice what the Lord says in verse number 4. Nevertheless, even though there's many good things that I have said about this church, I have somewhat against thee. The Lord is saying, there's many good things, and I mention them, that you're doing. You're working for me. You're serving me. You're doing a good job serving me. You're keeping false doctrine from getting into the church. You're doing very good, but I've got something against thee. What could the Lord have against a church like that? I mean, that seems like a great church. They evidently had several pastors in the church. Must have had a large congregation in that church. And the Lord says, you've done many good works, but I've got something against thee. Verse 4 says, what it, what it is, because thou hast left thy first love. Amen. You're doing a lot of good things, but you've left your first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Now don't forget where you came from. Don't forget who it was that saved you. Don't forget how appreciative you were when you heard about Jesus. Don't forget all the things he did for you. Don't forget how much you loved him. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. The Lord said many good things about this church. But he says, I want to tell you something. Though you're doing some great things, I have something I've got to tell you. And the Lord Jesus tells them, you have left your first love. You know, there's few things that we're going to be able to take to heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Charity never faileth. Charity is the deepest form of love there is. And so charity never faileth. Now, there's some things we're not going to be able to take to heaven. For instance, we'll not take faith to heaven. There'll not be any faith in heaven because we'll see then perfectly and clearly and we won't need faith when we're there. We're not going to take hope to heaven because in heaven, all of our hope will be fulfilled. Hope is expectation, but all of our expectations will be fulfilled. We'll not take prophecies to heaven. We'll not need anybody to tell us what the future is or what's going to happen in heaven because they will have all been fulfilled. There's several things we can't take to heaven. Don't miss this. We won't take soul winning to heaven. 
We need to win souls here, but we won't take soul winning to heaven because there will not be any lost sinners there. We'll not take forgiveness to heaven because when we get to heaven, there'll be no sin there and we won't need forgiveness anymore. We'll not take mercy to heaven because mercy will not be needed there. But one thing that we'll take to heaven is love. Charity never faileth. Love never faileth. Love is something that we can take to heaven. We can take our love that we have for God here and we can take that to heaven. Preachers and Sunday school teachers and those of you that are responsible for ministering to people, teach your people to love Jesus. It's important that you teach them the Bible. It's important that you teach them the doctrines that we understand the Bible teaches. It's important that you teach them to live right and act right. But the most important thing that you have to teach people is to love Jesus. Teach them that because if you'll teach them to love Jesus, they'll love Jesus all of their lives and when they get to heaven, they'll be able to take that love with them. Now, the truth is, there's many people in our churches that are guilty of loving things more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love their house more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love their cars more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love their friends more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love their wife or their husband more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love their children more than they love Jesus. There's some people in our churches that are saved that love money more than they love Jesus. Some people that love prestige and recognition more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love sports more than they love Jesus. There's some people that love popularity more than they love Jesus. Now, I'm not preaching to those people today. I'm not preaching to those people that love earthly possessions or things here on earth more than they love Jesus today. I'm not preaching to them. But I'm going to preach for these next few minutes to those that love spiritual things more than they love God. Sometimes spiritual things can get between us and our love for the Lord. It happens subtly. It happens gradually. We love the Lord, but all of a sudden, if we're not careful, we will love spiritual things more than we love Jesus. And that's the group that I want to speak to today. Not to that group that love earthly things more than they love the Lord, but I want to speak to those that we would say are probably the best Christians in this church but you've gotten to the place that you love spiritual things more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ himself listen to me it's a sin to love soul winning more than you love God now the truth is we should win souls the truth is we should love lost souls. The truth is heaven is real. And the truth is every person who dies without Jesus Christ spends eternity burning and suffering and tormented in hell. That is true. And we ought to love souls and we ought to be concerned about them and we ought to do what we can to bring them to the Lord. But we need to be careful that the work for God that we get involved in does not but you get between us and the Lord and we get to the place that we love the work of God more than we love the God of the work. Hudson Taylor was a great missionary of another time. And one time somebody asked Hudson Taylor, is the main thing for a missionary to love souls? And he answered, he said, no, 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 a hundred times no. The main thing for a missionary is to love God. And I say to those of you that are preachers and teachers, it's important that you love souls. You'll not be an effective minister or preacher or teacher of the Word of God unless you love souls. But the most important thing you can do is fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and love Him and let Him know that you love Him because when you love Jesus, people will see that and it'll affect your ministry. The main thing is for us to 
love the Lord. Those of you that love to win souls, and there's some people that are specially, I think, gifted in a way to go out and talk to people. They have a special Holy Ghost boldness to talk to people about the Lord. And they're great soul winners, and that's important. But don't love soul winning more than you love the one that you're trying to win souls to. There's some of you that work in the van ministry here. Thank God for you. I appreciate you. You're doing a great work for God. But remember, the purpose of the van ministry is to bring people to Jesus. And if you love Jesus, then you need to get busy working in that ministry. But don't let the van ministry be more important to you than your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people like to hand out tracts. And we have the best tracts, I think, that you can get. They're very expensive. They're chick tracts. But I say they're very good because people will read them. You can have a very great track and if nobody reads it, it doesn't do any good. But people will read these and usually when you hand one out, maybe ten people will do it. And some of you love to hand out track. You put them, uh, I used to say you could put them in phone booths, but there's not many phone booths anymore. But you can put them on places and give them and people, you sit back and see them as they pick them up or you hand them to somebody. You love to do that. But don't love that work for God more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful that the devil does not put the souls of men as a priority in your life before the Lord Jesus Christ. Be very careful. In verse 4 of Revelation chapter 2, we see that these great Christians at Ephesus had left their first love. They had left that first love that they had for the Lord. They had left it. It was gone. I mean, they, they were so busy working for God that they forgot that they were to love God. And it just had gotten cloudy. In verse 5 of the text, the Lord says, after you fall in love with me, then you work for me. But you love God first. Put Jesus first place in your life. Love Him first. And if you love God, you'll work for God. You hear what I said? Amen. If you love the Lord, you'll work for the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, if you fall in love me, with me, you'll work for God. You can work for God without loving God. That's what I found out in ministering for many years. There's many people that can work for God without really loving the Lord Jesus Christ. But you cannot love Jesus without working for Him. If you love Him, you're going to work for Him. Jesus says, I want you to work for me. I want you to play the piano and play the musical instruments. I want you to sing in the choir. I want you to lead the singing. I want you to take care of the sound equipment. I want you to work in the van. I want you to do that. But more than that, I want you to love me with your whole being. I want you to love me. I want you to work for me. But don't forget that your priority in life is to love me. The van ministry is important. God bless those people that work in it. I support it. I encourage people to work in it. Kids are important. They're near the heart of God. If we don't get them to Jesus, they may never get to Jesus. But the day is coming when there'll not be a need for a van ministry anymore. The day is coming when we won't be able to win souls anymore. But we need to remember that there'll never be a day that we don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, those of you that are spiritual, busy working for God, don't put the work of God before loving the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me say this. Don't put the church, and don't love the church more than you love Jesus. Amen. Don't love the church more than you love Jesus. Now I love the church. I love Anchor Bible Baptist Church. I told you the story that when I was born my mother and dad brought me home from a little clinic in Mercedes, Texas, just a few miles from here. And my dad said my mother went on in the house where we lived. And then my dad carried me in the house. And my dad told me, he said, Johnny, I held you up to heaven. 
And I said, God, make a preacher out of my boy. Make a preacher out of my boy. Well, it was nine years later when I was saved and baptized. And then when I was 21, I was licensed as a Baptist preacher. And when I was 22, I was ordained as a Baptist preacher. And God created me. He made me. But now listen. When He made me, He made me primarily to love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's... Now... God called me to preach later on, and I surrendered to preach. But He didn't make me to preach. He made me as a creature to love Jesus. And He made you as a creature to love Jesus. Now, I love the church. I love this church. I love this pulpit. I had this pulpit specially made. It's custom made. I love that communion table. We had it custom made. I love that piano that Miss Bonnie donated to our church. I love that. I love these seats that you're sitting in. I love the organ we have. I love the baptistry and that beautiful baptistry picture that uh, uh, Mom Vanna Lee painted for us right here. Vanna Lee, raise your hand. She's the one. Eh, she didn't want to raise her hand right then. But she's the one that did that for us. And these beautiful chairs and, and the beautiful lights that Pamela picked out for this auditorium. I love this church. But I've got to be careful that I don't love this church more than I love the the church, the Lord Jesus, for whom this church is here for. I've got to be certain that I don't love the church more than I love Jesus. It's easy to get caught up in our church. It's easy to get caught up in our church work. But we've got to be careful that we always stay in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. There should be nothing between us and our love for Him. Let me ask you a question. And you be honest with yourself. Have you told Jesus today that you love him? I mean, you got up this morning and you were busy and you showered and you cleaned up and you shaved and put your cologne or perfume on and, and got ready to come to church and you were busy and perhaps listened to some music on the way. But I wondered if you stopped and just told Jesus, I love you. I asked Stephen to sing that song today, my favorite song. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. I wonder as you got ready to come and worship the Lord today by doing whatever it is that you do here, did you stop and just tell Jesus that you love Him? Let's be careful that we don't love soul winning more than we love Jesus. Let's be careful that we don't love the church more than we love Jesus. But let me say this. Let's be careful that we don't love salvation more than we love Jesus. Amen. I know that Luke chapter 10 verse 20 says, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice, rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Amen. The great thing of salvation. Boy, I was saved when I was nine years old. What a great day that was. And what a great day it was in your life when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you became a child of God. And we rejoice in that, but let's not forget to love the one that saved us that day. In Numbers chapter 21, if you have your Bibles, turn back there. I don't usually turn all over the Scriptures when I'm preaching, but toward the front of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then the fourth book, Numbers chapter 21. I want you to look quickly at verse number 4. Numbers chapter 21, look at verse number 4. Verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Do you ever get discouraged? I mean, you're serving God and you're doing what God wants you to do and you're in the way living for God. But these people had just been delivered out of bondage and all of a sudden they got discouraged. Verse number 5 says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. You know when we get discouraged and we're not careful, we'll get angry 
angry at God and then God's man. That's what these people did. And notice what they started, as my dad would say, an old-fashioned word, belly aching, complaining, belly aching, complaining. Wherefore have ye brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? I mean, imagine the miracles that they'd seen God do. Imagine as they saw, I think Pamela taught in Sunday school today, the Red Sea opening and the children of Israel passing through. Uh, wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, for our soul li uh, loatheth this light bread. This light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent on the brass, he lived. You know that story. The children of Israel had left Egypt, and they were on their way to the promised land. But then they started belly aching. They started complaining. By the way, in the Bible, complaining is a terrible sin. In the Bible, it is a terrible sin that will bring the punishment of God. In fact, you'll find more people punished for complaining in the Bible than you'll find people punished for getting drunk. You'll find more people punished for complaining in the Bible than you'll find for people that were punished for committing adultery. Complaining. You know what they're doing? They were looking to Moses and to God, and they were saying, God, I don't like this light bread that you've given us. We don't like it, God. We're a, you're a mean God. You're not providing us what we want. We miss the, the things we had back in Egypt, and God, we don't like what you're doing for us. God, we despise you, and we loathe this light bread. What they were saying to God, and this is what complaining is, don't miss it. You're a lousy God. For you let this to happen to me, you're a lousy God. For me to be in this situation that I'm in, you're a lousy God. You could have stopped it, but no, you brought me here. You could have kept it. You could have said, God, you're, uh, you could have said, God, you're a lousy God. You took my little son. You took my daughter. That's what complaining is. And that's why God says, I'm not going to put up with it. And he sent serpents to go throughout all that land. And anybody that was bit by that serpent died. And evidently thousands of people died because they had complained against God. The people all of a sudden repent. And they go to Moses and they say, Moses, please, please Moses, go to God and tell him we're sorry. Go to God and do something about it. Moses goes to God. And God tells him, all right, you take some brass and you form a serpent and you put that serpent up on a pole and anybody that looks at that serpent, if they've been bitten by a snake, if they'll look at that serpent they will live. Look and live is an old song we used to sing. Look to that serpent and live. And so Moses goes and he forms a serpent and he lifts it up on a pole and he tells people if you've been bitten, just look to that serpent and you will live. A man has a son that is bitten by a snake and all of a sudden that son's leg starts swelling up and his body gets very weak and he runs a high fever and he says I don't know what to do I don't want to lose my son and so he takes that son to where that serpent is and says son Moses said that God said if you'll look to that serpent you can live and the boy goes and he looks up to that serpent and all of a sudden just like that he's instantly healed and he lives by the way if you turn in the New Testament to John chapter 3 the 
Lord Jesus became that serpent on the pole. And he said, anybody that will look to Jesus, if you've been bitten by sin, and we all have been, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you don't do something about it, you're going to die and spend eternity in hell. But if you'll look up to that pole, if you'll look up to Jesus, you can live and be sure that your sins will be forgiven and you'll be taken care of. What I'm saying is we love our salvation. Amen. But look what happens to these people. Those Jews were pleased at what God told Moses and what they did. But years later, you could read about it in 2 Kings chapter 18. The Jewish people took that serpent, that serpent on a pole, and they made a special altar out of it. And they put that brazen serpent there on that altar, and they started bowing to that brazen serpent and they started worshiping that brazen serpent and God was unhappy yes. and so Hezekiah the king went and he destroyed that brazen serpent and he said Nehushtan, Nehushtan, just a piece of silver, just a piece of brass, just a piece of brass. What I'm saying is my friend, thank God for your salvation, but don't love your salvation more than you love the Savior that saved you. Remember what he did for you, but don't fall out of love with the one who saved you. Salvation is important, but let's be sure we remember the one that saved us. The Ephesus church was a great church. It was a soul winning church. It was a big church. It was a doctrinally sound church. It evidently was a very influential church. It had preachers in it. They were doing a lot of good things. But the Lord said to that church, I want you to fall in love with me again. I want you to love me. Remember when you first got saved? And remember how you loved reading about about me and hearing about me? Remember how you cried when you heard about Jesus dying for you on the cross? Remember how much you appreciated me? And you remember since you've been saved all the times that your back's been up against the wall and you didn't know what you were going to do and I was right there to embrace you? You remember how you used to love me? I'm glad that you're serving me. I'm glad you're working for me. I'm glad you're doing these good things for me. But he says, what I want you to do, Anchor Bible Baptist Church, I want you to fall in love with me again. I want you to love me. My Jesus, I love thee. How many times a day do you from your heart just think about Jesus? Remember, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Wherever you are, he is. If you're riding and driving in the car, he's right there with you. If you're a passenger in a car, he's right there with you. If you're at work, he's right next to you. If you're washing the dishes, he's right there with you. If you're vacuuming the floors, he's right there with you. He's always with you. Just look over sometime and by faith realize his presence. What I've often said is practice his presence. Realize that he's right there. And just look over to him and say, Jesus... I love you. I love you. I love you. Don't love things more than you love the Lord. A husband buys his wife a beautiful gift. And she's very excited. She has a choice what to say. She can go around and say, look what my husband bought me. Or she can go around and say, look who gave me this gift. And that's the way it is with the Lord. We can go around and say, look what he's done for me. Or we can say, look to the one who's done everything for me.